Is it on? So we are going to start with our basic notions seminar. So it's a great pleasure for me to, to introduce Alicia Dickenstein. It's a, it's a great honor for me. So he, she is from uh, the University of Buenos Aires, and she's going to talk about uh, toward a multivariate Descartes rule, but still far away. So thank you very much. Thank you. OK, this is meant to be elementary. Okay, I hope I can do that. So I will remind you this uh, Descartes rule of science, and then I will try to present two uh, multivariate generalizations. This is a, a rule for polynomials in one variable to count the number of positive roots. And then I will try to summarize and show you how wide open is the uh, complete generalization, even if it is very easy to state. So the Descartes, uh, in 1637, so this is long ago, he wrote uh, an appendix called La Geometrie uh, to this um, book, which is mainly in philosophy. And uh, the book is available. You go to gutenberg.com or something like this. You can download the book and see how. He... And then <clears throat> the rule is very, very simple. It says as follows. Suppose you have a polynomial with real coefficients. Then the number of positive real roots, so the number of complex roots is equal to the degree. So here, I'm not saying this in this uh, slide, but we count with multiplicity, okay? So the number of complex roots is, if CR is non-zero, is R. But the number of positive real roots that I would denote with this symbol, he says, is bounded by the number of sign variations, V of F, in the order sequence of coefficients. This means for each of these numbers, I take the sign. For instance, in this case, here C0, I don't know, it has some sign. This 3 is positive, minus 90 is negative, 2 is positive, and 1 is positive. So this would be my list of signs, OK? So I order the monomials. I put here the list of signs. And I count each time there is a sign change. So here, from here to here is plus plus. I don't count. Here is a one sign, one variation, one variation. And here it depends on the sign of uh, C, C, C sub 0. So there could be two or at most three uh, jumps. So this means that this polynomial, independently of the degree, this could be any number, OK? Independently of how many zero coefficients you have of the degree, it cannot have more than two or three positive roots. It's really so simple that it's amazing that we cannot generalize it. <laughs> well, maybe because it's too simple. So this, I repeated this. And there is something else that it's easy to prove, is that um, the, these two numbers, the true number of positive roots and this upper bound have the same parity. So for instance, if the C0 is minus 1, I get the sign variation is 3. This means my polynomial could have either 3 or 1 positive root. I cannot decide with this, but it's quite accurate. And in general, it's a sharp bound for, because if one picks a polynomial with all real roots, then it is an equality. And in fact, his proof in 1637, there were not complex number field. You know, complex numbers were not there. It was just imaginary thing that didn't exist at, at most. So, and so for him, all the rules were real. And in this case, it is an equality. So one important case in which you have all uh, real roots is if you have the characteristic polynomial of a symmetric matrix. So this, you do this stupid count, and you get exactly how many positive eigenvalues you have and how many, and if, how many negatives in this case is obvious. But if you want to count the number of negative roots, what do you do? Well, you can count positive and zero and subtract. <laughs> But no, you cannot subtract because you don't know how many real roots. How do you do? How do you count negative? You put f of minus x and count positive. Right? So it's this, the, the odd exponents, will, you will change the coefficient. 
And so the one consequence of this, which is important, is that the number of positive real roots is independent of the degree. It depends on how many non-zero terms. If I don't have many non-zero terms, I cannot have many positive roots. For instance, just if you take x to the n minus 1, there are n complex solutions, all the roots of unity, but I have a coefficient of 1 minus 1. The rule says I cannot have more than one positive root, and indeed the only positive root is 1. Okay. okay. He, of course, did not prove the result in general, but we can prove it very easily. You can use your way home in the bus 6 or yeah, unless you are driving, you can prove it in your way home. And the main uh, point is uh, Rolle's theorem. What does Rolle's theorem tells you? tell you? Uh, what does tell you? So it tells you that between two consecutive roots of f, there has to be a root of the derivative. So I have two roots. Here I have a point with horizontal tangent. Here I have two roots. I have another one. So I have three. f has three real roots, and f prime has two. And if you count with multiplicity, this is also the case. OK, oh, of course, we could, we could be either we can just displace like this. We add a constant so we don't change the derivative. So in this case, so the, the number of roots of the derivatives in all these three cases is two. But here I have only po one positive root here. Here I will have only one negative root, not positive. And um, I was, we have to see. And then, then here I have three. And then what the, the main thing about Rolle theorem, it says that the number of positive roots of f prime is at least the number of positive roots of f minus 1, which says that you can bound the number of positive roots of f knowing how many positive roots your derivative has. And so it's very easy to do a proof by induction. The degree is induction in the degree. You, you differentiate, you assume this holds for f prime, and you go up and you, you use this thing. Okay. OK, so I spoil the proof because it's just once, but you have to deal a little bit with what happens in the boundary, but it takes one minute. OK, so how could one phrase a multivariate uh, rule? So one way of doing this is the following. So we, we pick n polynomials in n variables because we want to have a finite number of solutions. We want to count. We need a finite number to count. Okay? So we start saying well, one polynomial is well, It could be enough in one variable you take you could have a polynomial with a single positive root. But in general, you, you expect to have n polynomials and n variables. I'm going to call, as before, r plus 1 the number of monomials. And then I consider a system of these uh, polynomials. And so the input of this system, there are, are two matrices. One is the matrix of exponents, which I am go going to call A. And this, ex this exponent vector is going to be the j's exponent vector is going to be the j's column of my matrix. So I can assemble the exponents as column vectors of this matrix and the coefficients uh, in this matrix. So I have two matrices of the same size. Both have n rows and r plus 1 columns. Okay? So I have two matrices. And here a is in principle. Uh, a positive integers, but really, if you are going to look for solutions in the positive order, we can put real exponents. So we have these two matrices of the same size. And so the question is, given this matrix, and I'm going to assume that the rank is n, otherwise you will have, finite, uh, you will have a, a probably infinite number of solutions. Also, I have to assume that C has maximal rank, otherwise you have less than n, uh, n polynomials. But this is minor. So I have these two matrices. And the question is how to find a simple rule of science in the spirit of the card rule that gives a sharp upper bound for the number of positive solutions, means solutions x, all whose, all whose coordinates are positive, uh, of this system. Okay? This would be the, the goal. 
Okay, what happens is that in any number of variables there exists, so this thing that I remarked that the card rule says that the number of positive roots depends on the number of monomials and not on the degree. So there was a conjecture that this holds in general. And this was indeed proved by Askol Hovansky in the 80s. It was really a breakthrough. And, but he only takes into account the exponents and he gives a bound in terms of the number of monomials, which is really non, non sharp. It's, it's incredibly big, but it's fantastic because there is such a, uh, a bound. And then in 96, it's already 20 years ago, uh, Ilya Ittenberg and Marie Francoise Roy tried to give a conjecture of what should be the Descartes rule. Uh, in fact, the, this, the conjecture was disproven uh, quickly, but they gave a lower bound of the upper bound. So they constructed systems with that many solutions, so the upper bound should be at least this number, but this was, they conjectured it was the upper bound, but it was not. I will, as, say, as I said, I will present two partial generalization, and really the full generalization is really open, so you can work on this. And so the first generalization is uh, jo uh, joint work with all these people uh, because we met at uh, Dachstuhl, which is like over World Fachbach for computer science, and we all were working in applications to these biochemical reaction networks I talked about the other day. And we realized that there were many signs. Everybody has different things about science. And in many applications in, of mathematics, even in economics or whatever, the people are trying to understand how many positive roots. So there are many different theorems that were used in science, and we asked ourselves why, and we gave some theorems that have somehow abstract all of this. So, but what we can answer is to give conditions that imply that there is a most one positive root. And then the other para, para, generalization is something I did with uh, Frédéric Pihan. He's at the uh, Université Savoie Montblanc in France. And what we did is just, if you wish, the easiest, the first, the following case is we assume that we have, if you have n plus two monomials in n variables, they are, they are finally independent. They are like the vertices of a simplex. This is just essentially like a linear system, okay? So this is obvious. So the first case, is if you have n plus two monomials in n variables. This is called a circuit with a tiny detail that I will define. And you, I will try to show you that even in this simple case, it is so complicated that we understand why it is difficult to, to generalize. Okay, so the input is, I, I call it generalized because I assume that the matrix of exponents is also real, but again, I have two matrices of the same size. Uh, here, its size is going to be it's a technical R, not R plus, plus one, you will see in a second why. But I also have R positive parameters, okay? Just let me go back one second. When one sees, I had seen the Cardinal of Science many times, and it seems to say something about your polynomial. It does not. It says something about the family of polynomials with the same signs as the coefficients as your polynomial. Really, the, the, the value of the coefficients, you don't care. What you care is which are the signs of the coefficients. This means if you take your polynomial, you multiply all coefficients by positive numbers, the answer is the same, okay? So in fact, you are talking about this, so this is what we are doing. We are multiplying each polynomial by the, for any i for the fixed uh, positive constant, so we are keeping uh, the signs of the coefficients and more than the signs of the coefficients. So now, so asserting the, now it's a stupid thing, if, we want, if I want to write this equals to y, so I have a, I have this polynomial f, k i for each i equal to y, k i equal to y i, I can do it like this, you put it equal to zero. And now I have a new monomial, which is the constant term. Okay, now I have R plus one. But now, just as deciding the number of positive solutions of this system, deciding that this is at most one, means that there is at most 
given y that is at most 1x such that fk of x equals y. So this means that it's the same thing as saying that this map f is injective. Okay, so the, the, the statements are going to show you for a while, we'll talk about injectivity. But injectivity of F is the same as uh, saying that this system of equations could have at most one solution. Okay, so we are going to call sigma the component-wise uh, sign of the vector. So for instance, sigma of 1, 2, 0, minus 2 is this vector, plus, plus, 0, minus. It lies here, okay? And then the theorem says the following. So this is a simplified version, but it's enough for our purposes. The following statements are equivalent. The map FK is ejective, and here this red is main point, not for a fixed choice of coefficients. It's injective for any choice of coefficients. If and only if this condition holds, let me try to parse for you what is said here. Is said here. First, this is implied by the fact that the rank of the matrix is n. Okay, I have a matrix of rank of n. This implies that the, 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 the kernel of the transpose is zero. So this is a, a statement about the rank. But this statement says the following. So the image of a transpose, so a is a matrix both A and, and C. I'm, uh, here in, in, in all this story, we're assuming that R, R is at least N. Otherwise, if I have too many monomers, it doesn't make sense. If it, in fact, even bigger. So I have this matrix, which is N times both uh, N times uh, R, I guess. And then the transpose is, will be like this, will be R times N. So the kernel of C and the image of this map, which is the column space, lie in R to the R. Okay? So both the kernel of C and the image of, this map, of the transpose both lie in R to the R. So if we have a subspace in the plane, a line in the plane, it will be, it could be like this, it could be like this, or could be any of these two, okay? But each of these subspaces hits or meets some orthans and not other Or What's an orthan? An orthan is a choice of sign for each uh, coordinate. So in, in fact, this is an orthan with my definition. An orthan lies in, in three to the n. So it could be all two coordinates positive, or uh, here n is two, okay? Two coordinates positive, one positive, one, ne one negative, one positive, whatever. So you have, a, you have, a, have a subspace, it will hit certain orthans and not other ones. Obviously, always hit you, a subspace will go through zero. Sorry? The matrix C is the, ah, it's a matrix of coefficients. Sorry, I didn't say it. So we have, we have, our equations are C, I, J, X to the A, J. So C is the matrix of coefficients. There are, I goes one to N is the number of equations and J is how many monomials you have. So I have this matrix, and I have this, and the AJ are the columns of. I put them as columns of A. And so what this says is, well, if it happens that this is an infinite leaf, the only way in which for no K, for all k, sorry, it is injective, it's when these two subspaces don't intersect the same orthon unless it is the origin. Okay? They have to live in different orthons. Okay? And 
just a comment, when this is zero, this is a question of the rank of the matrix. This condition depends only, as I said, in the orthon that they meet. Okay, there's a case in which we can certify that, that there is at most one positive root. Each one A equals C. It could happen that A equals C, okay? If this happens, and the matrix has rank N, so this condition is satisfied, as I, as I said. But now we need to look at this condition, okay? What happens with this condition? We have A, and here we have A transpose, okay? Well, this matrix is like this, and this matrix is like this. Could it be that something, some vector in the transpose is in the kernel of the matrix? If we take here a vector V, which is in, in, the, in the kernel, but we, can, we also have this vector V in the row span of A. So if this vector, transpose, if this vector is, in, is, is here, it has to be ortho, in, is in the kernel orthogonal to itself. So unless the vector is already here, this cannot happen. So if A equals C, this condition is certainly satisfied. And so if we pick as the matrix of coefficient the same matrix of exponents, there could be at most one positive real root. And this is, in fact, the content of a famous theorem in statistics, is, which is called Birch's theorem. Okay, now let me be more explicit what is in there, okay? Why, where do we took these conditions? Okay, in fact, there is a third condition which says that the Jacobian is invertible. So, oh, I'm sorry. Which says that these two conditions are equivalent, and in fact, this is the way the proof goes, to the fact that the, 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 the Jacobian determinant is non-zero. But here, the quantifiers are crucial. Here it says, if for any x and any k this happens, then for all k this is injective. But here, there are no k's, no x's, nothing, okay? This statement is equivalent, not for a fixed k. It's equivalent for all k, it happens if this is never zero for any k, for any uh, x. So let me try to show you what the statement says. So if what happens is that over the complex numbers, locally, uh, allomorphic math is invertible if and only if the derivative is non-zero. But over the real numbers, this is not true. We can just take x minus one cube, it's a fabulous, uh, perfect uh, injective function, and yet the derivative vanishes at one. So vanishing of the derivative does not imply that the function is not injective. But what the theorem says is the following. This is where the k play a role. They say, okay, this is maybe not injective, but the fact that the derivative vanishes at one implies so let me go back. Sorry, if the derivative, if this is zero for some x, this, this cannot happen for all k. Okay, this means that there is a choice of positive numbers so that if I, I multiply the coefficient of my polynomial by this positive number, this will have more than one positive root. This is a statement. Hmm? Not that, because there is no bijection, bijection one one, okay? But what is nice about this statement is that this is combinatorics, is somehow depends or in the combinatorics or the linear algebra of the exponents and the coefficients. Okay, so from this we can uh, deduce uh, the first, what I call the first part of the cart rule. Now we, we put one monomial on the other, as I, as I put before, now I'm, I can decide when, can I, how many, I given a y, I give them the matrix of exponents and I give them the matrix of coefficients and before and I give you a y in Rn. And so I want to a condition because the, I, ha, I have a condition, okay? I have this condition. I have this condition, but I want a way of checking this condition, okay? A way of doing that is the following. So you compute all the maximal minors of these matrices. If it happened that the corresponding minors have all the time the same sign, in fact, or all the time the opposite, but it doesn't matter, and at least once this is non-zero, so there is a choice of minors so that both are non-zero, and this has, this is positive and positive. And then if you 
look anywhere else, any other mine, or they have to be all the time the same size. Okay, if you check this, this is equivalent to this condition that I, uh, sorry, that I had. So if I have two matrices and this product of determinants is either zero has the same signs, mean all other non-zero such products, for example, if it is positive, it is positive all the time. And moreover, uh, there is at least one non-zero, then there could be for any choice at most one positive solution. Now, there are some signs here. There are the signs of the minors, but we say all, yeah. You want? No, but if, if it is non-zero, local it's injective. If it is zero in the real case, you cannot deduce anything. What you can deduce is if it is zero, for some coefficients with the same signs, it won't be injective. This is what you can deduce. Inverse function? No, there is no inverse function. Gobian is locally, is locally injective. No, well, there is a Jacobian conjecture, but hasn't been proved. <laughs> in the complex case, over the real case, in the real case is false anyway. Over the complex case, it, the, the Jacobian conjecture says that if you have a, a map whose Jacobian is a non-zero constant, then it's invertible and the inverse is also a polynomial. It, it means it has to be, because you take this function e to the z, the exponential, which the derivative is never, uh, uh, zero and it's locally invertible, but it's a strong assertion about if you have a polynomial map and blah blah blah. Okay. No, uh, but now the question is: Okay, there could be at most one. When is it that there is one? Okay, and so before looking at my slides, look at me for a second. So I have this, uh, well, let me write the whole vector f. So I have, well, okay, let's like write this. I have this. Then this is, this says the following. It says, I take the matrix C, I multiply by the vector x to the a1, x to the a r, and I get the vector y. Okay, so this means that the vector y is this number times the first column of my matrix plus this number times the second column all the way, okay? This vector is a linear combination of the columns of my matrix, and the coefficients are this. If there is a positive solution, these are positive numbers. Okay, so this means if I'm going, if I call C1, CR, the column vectors, this means that if Y is in the image, it has to be a positive combination of the columns. Positive combination is called the cone generated by the columns. So a necessary condition to be in the image is, <coughs> so Y, necessary condition to be in the image is that Y lies in this cone, it's a positive combination of the columns. The, the vector given the, the mu's there is just, these are the mu's, okay? But in fact, what here we say, we need to add a couple of hypotheses and say then the converse is true. And the hypothesis is, okay, here I put it, they find the same oriented matrix to be quick. But what this means is all the time the minors of A and C have the same sign. In the previous statement, it was a little bit uh, more general, one could be zero and the other not zero, but here, say, so if all the time the minors of A and C have the same sign, and the column vectors of A, 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 A lie in an open half space, which is kind of mild, then once Y could be in the image, it is. And this statement 
uses degree theory. So we prove it in a quick way because there was a previous paper by two co-authors who had already used degree theory, but this uses, this is not easy. I mean, not, not uh, so basic. Okay, now let me tell you what we did for circuits, okay? So now we have n plus two monomials. So my, my R is n plus one. I have n plus two monomials, and I, I have n polynomials with n plus two monomials. The number of monomials goes from zero to, uh, the, the indices go from zero to n plus one for some historical reasons. And then we have uh, this exponent matrix. Now the notation is from zero to n plus one, which is has n rows and n plus two columns. And the coefficient matrix, the same size, but real numbers. And we assume that both have full rank n. And so the question is, we're going to call n a of c. So a are the exponents, and c is the coefficients. And we want, once we fix a and c, understand the number of positive solutions of this system in terms of the sign variation of some sequence that we have to determine. So we don't know for the moment. Okay, but this is the problem. Okay, so instead of considering just A, we are going to enhance A. So we are going to assume that A is the matrix to say something, 1, 2, 0, 1, 1, 1, 3, 2, okay? Then we are going to consider A bar, and A bar means that we are going to add a row of ones. Why do we want a row of ones? <laughs> because what, now the question is, okay, let me stop for a second. Before we wrote this uh, statement that I'm going to tell you in a while, I decided to stop and think. <laughs> Why this condition should depend on? So if I have a system like this, n polynomials like this, does it really depend on the actual value of the CIJ? The answer is no. It only depends on the row span of the matrix C, on the linear space they span. Because if I, instead of my polynomials, I pick, uh, I pick uh, a generic linear combination of them, I will get the same result. Okay, if instead of writing F1 and F2, I write F1 and F1 plus F2. So it's really something that should depend on the vector space generated by the rows of my matrix C, okay? So as such, <laughs> it has to depend on the way of um, picking a point, picking a subspace is picking a point in a Grassmannian. So I need to pick a point in a Grassmannian, so it has to depend on the way of, uh, of uh, in, uh, embedding uh, the subspaces of certain dimension. This is a subspace of dimension n in R to the R is by the minors of the matrix. So it should depend on the minors and not on the particular coefficients. This was the first observation. And what happens with A? So with A, what happens is that it should depend on the affinely on A, not only linearly. So linearly would amount, so if I, if I, if I make a linear change, would, it's, this is in the exponents, would be just a, a monomial change of variables, but also, if, if we have, if you are to look in this equal to zero, because in this instance now I'm, I'm writing this equal to zero, n plus one, say r, equal to zero, then if I, this, and I'm looking for x, which is positive, x is non-zero, all coordinates are non-zero. If I multiply here by any monomial, whatever monomial I want, I'm going to get the same positive solution because a monomial does not vanish in the positive order. So I should be able, I could add a constant thing here. How do you add? So it should be independent of, of, of translations. So if you have three points, it doesn't matter if if they are linearly independent, it matters if they lie on the same line or not. What, what matters is the affine geometry of your exponents, not on the linear geometry of the exponents. Okay? So it has to depend. And adding these ones, sorry, I, I deleted, but adding these ones 
I have my matrix A and I add a row of ones. This matrix has the property that the kernel of this matrix are the affine relations among the columns. So affine relations, the linear relations are that all the, uh, all the, the coefficients add up to zero. And these are the things that are also invariant under translation. So it should depend on the affine structure of A. So it should depend on the minors of this matrix. So the, whatever answer is there, eh, it has to be dependent on the minors of C and on the minors of A bar. This is the first thing that we thought. How we didn't know for the moment, OK? So we take this matrix, and maybe you know, now we have a matrix, so we, we had n times n plus 2, now it's n plus 1 times n plus 2. So if I take, it's a, a, a full, it's full rank, so the kernel has dimension 1. And it is a generic way to pick in an element in the kernel of a matrix of core rank 1. Is you skip each one of the columns, you get a squared matrix, you compute the determinant of that, and you put it with signs. And this gives an element of there. So there is a generic way of solving such a system. So what here it says is that this matrix has a kernel of <coughs> dimension 1, and the, the, the generator of the kernel is the vector obtained up to sign, but the determinants, you skip the first column, then the second, etc., and you compute all the minors. Okay? This is the generator of the kernel. OK, so we are going to assume that this is a circuit. Circuit means that all lambda j's are non-zero, because otherwise the points will lie on, on a line. We won't really. Three of the points will lie on a line. We don't want. We want that any three of the points are affinely independent. And so this is just all lambda j's are non-zero. If you have four points, so n plus 2, if n is 2, is 4. You have four points in the plane. There are essentially two different configurations. Either like this, they are the vertices of their convex hull, or one point is inside the convex hull of the others. These are the exponents. And we are going to see that the number of positive roots here is more restricted than here. So the, the relative positions of the points in the exponents will bound the number of positive roots. <coughs> and if you know, if I start, if I start moving, moving this point up to here, when, I, when this point gets here, one of the minors of, of A bar is going to be zero. If I move it here, one minor that was here positive will become negative or the other way about. So you, you cross from this configuration to this configuration, but you, at some moment, one minor uh, becomes zero. Okay? So the, the minors of this matrix explain to you which is the relative positions of the points in uh, N space. OK. so. As before, if, sorry, is, if there is a positive solution, then if there is a positive solution to this equation with zero here, zero has to lie in the positive cone spine than the colors of my matrix. Okay? Because if there is such a solution, this vector is going to give the, the coefficients of the collinear combination. So this is a necessary condition for the existence of at least one positive root. Okay? So we will assume this, because this is. But what is interesting is that we will see a way that, and this will explain why we could work with the um, case n plus 2. Because the matrix, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm having matrices of size Both are of size n times n plus 2, and the rank is n. What is the dimension of the kernel of C? It's 2, right? So I have here, I write here a basis of the kernel. This is a matrix of size n plus 2 times 2. So the two uh, columns here is a basis of the kernel. Okay, this is what's called a Gale dual matrix. So this is going to be zero. Sufficient is zero. Okay. But now, instead of looking at the columns, I look at the row vectors. 
How many row vectors do I have? I have n plus two row vectors. So these row vectors that I'm going to call P0 up to P n plus one are called the Gale dual configuration of the column vector of my matrix. Okay? I can look at the columns of my matrix or dually, I can look at the rows of this matrix whose columns is the basis of the kernel. Okay, what happens if I do this? I'm going to call P this vector. And what it's easy to prove, this is well known, that instead of checking if zero is, or the condition that zero lies in the positive cone of the columns is equivalent to the fact that these row vectors lie in an open half space in the plane. So this is the case, for instance. So in this case, all lie in this open half space, and it could be, okay, they are, and then I look, they, they could be linearly dependent. They cannot be on both, if they are on both sides, then zero is not in the positive cone, and there is no positive real root, okay? If there is a positive real root, then, <coughs> Um, then uh, they lie in lines in a rays like this, and in this case there are four rays. So P0 and P1 is here, P2, this from P3 to P6 here, and P7 here. So there are four different rays containing them. This number, the number of rays, I'm going to call K. I have eight vectors from zero to seven. K is the number of lines containing the P's. And we will see that the theorem says there cannot be more than three positive roots. The maximum number, if there are four, is three. If there are k, is k minus one. Why? <coughs> so the theorem is a little bit complicated. Let me try to parse it for you. So we assume that the rank of this matrix A bar is n plus one, as I was doing, the rank of C is n and zero lies in the positive cone of the column. So there's the necessary condition is satisfied. And we call K the number of different lines containing the PIs. And then we are going to number all the points, to number the lines, but we are going to number the lines, I said, uh, counterclockwise, but this first, second, third, fourth, we are going to, we need to, to order them this way, but we will also number the points, so if this lie in, in this and this, this is bigger, these numbers have to be smaller than these numbers. So I, I need to, in, here I, I could put, this could be P1 and P0, but this could go after this one. I number them in this way, okay, according to this ordering of the lines. So we do this, and then here is the theorem. Let me try to read it for you. Okay, we can skip this. It says, the number of positive roots of the system of n polynomials with exponents in A and coefficient matrix C is at most the minimum of the sign variation of a sequence that I'm going to tell you in a second, but this sequence has k elements, so the sign variation is at most k minus one. And this number that you see there is the volume of the integer volume of the convex hull is the Bezu, it's like the Bezu bound, is a bound, is the BKK bound, is the number, the bound for the number of complex solutions to the system. I'm not going to, to put my finger now in this, but this number, you have A, you take the convex hull and you compute in general, if A spans Z to the N, you take N factorial times the Euclidean volume, and this is a bound for the number of complex solutions, huh? which is, uh, in particular case of this, is the classical Bezu bound, say, uh, polynomials degree D1, Dn, they couldn't be up there in the generic number of solutions, D1 times D2 times Dn. So when you have sparse sun monomials there, uh, the bound is this one. But let's forget about this, okay? So this is another bound, but this is smaller than this. So it's the sign variation of a sequence that has k numbers here, and k is the number of lines. Okay, uh, what I wrote here, uh, uh, here is what are the lambdas. So what are the lambdas? 
So I was calling lambda zero, lambda n plus one. These were these mi minors of this matrix, but this was a, a basis of the kernel, okay? And what this says is this lambda bar alpha i is the sum of the lambda j each time pj is in the alpha i line. So these are linear combinations of these elements here. Which linear combination? This linear combination is determined by the zero minors of C, because I didn't say it, but when two P's lie on the same line, you can see this on C saying that some minors of C are zero, that there is a perfect translation between minors of C and minors of uh, this uh, Gale dual matrix with the P's. So here says these are linear forms in the lambda that comes from the dependencies in the matrix of coefficients, for the zero minus in the matrix of coefficients. And moreover, the way you order, because it's, it's, you can have uh, this sequence or you can have this sequence. This has some variation one, this has some variation two, so it depends in which order you put them. Okay? The order you have to put them is the same order in which you are taking these lines in Geldua space for the C. So C tells you it's not there. These are just adding these things in the kernel of this matrix. <coughs> but in which order and which sums are prescribed by the linear dependencies in the matrix C? Okay? So you see it's already, it's, yes? So generically, we have the same number of lines than the number of Yes. Yes, so the, the upper, the, the, the in general, this k is going to be uh, n plus 2, so uh, the maximal possible number is n plus 1. But the size of the... This depends. Yes. This depends. You cannot have more than this. This plays a role. You will, we will see that the, the number of, in the plane, the, the maximum number is 3. But, for instance, if you take the unit square, the unit square has uh, this number is equal to two. So, in fact, in this case, this is smaller than that. So, in general, if, if your polytope is sufficiently big, big, it's just the sign variation that counts. Okay. I'm not going to tell you how we prove this. Uh, it's not very complicated, but there are many, many, many details. But the reason why we could prove it is that we, are, we, we go to the Gale dual thing and we have two variables where we dehomogenize and we land in one variable. This is one thing. And in one variable, we use a kind of a version of the cut rule. The cut rule holds not only for monomials. A polynomial is something you write as a linear combination of monomials. But you can write this as a linear combination of some other functions. And if this function satisfies certain properties, you can also read uh, the calculus from there. This is in a book by Polia and, it's not Polia, Shego, Polia and someone else, I don't remember now. So, but essentially we go back to the case of one variable, but there are lots of, lots of tiny details here and there, kind of very complicated. And also we, immediately passed to a Gale dual and the dehomogenize. And we had the proof and I couldn't, it took me several months to write down the proof. Because I saw the proof, I understood it locally, but I didn't understand it, so I couldn't write it. And then I, in fact, the, the way the paper is written, we go back to the minors of C. We don't talk essentially about it. We use this Gale dual in the proof, but not in the statement. The statement is about C, because when you homogen, when they take it out, C, you don't make any choices is when you understand what is happening. You cannot prove it, but it's the way of understanding what is happening. And until I, I did really understand it, I couldn't write it well. Okay, so for n equals one, we recover the known rule. I won't do it, but you believe me. Uh, as I said, the number is at most k, which could be at most n plus one. And then one question is, is this a sharp bound? One is, when is the bound at, attained? 
And so I need to introduce some uh, further definition, but this is easy. It's called the signature of a circuit. For instance, if my points are like this, this means that this a, 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 a positive combination of two is a positive combination of these other two. Let's say this is the point zero, one, two, three. This means that if you look at, at the vector of the kernel, zero and two will have some sign and one and three will have the opposite sign. There will be two pluses and two minus or two minus and two pluses. While if my configuration is like this one, one, is, one point is inside, then this is a positive combination of the other three. Okay, and you can put plus, minus, 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 or the other way about. So the difference here have one plus, three minus, or here two pluses and two minus. And this is what decides whether this point is inside or outside. Okay? So <coughs> in this case, the signature of the circuit is two. In this case, the signature of the circuit is, the signature is number of pluses, number of minus, uh, pluses or minus. And you put first the small number. And here is one, three. Okay. <coughs> so the signature is this uh, pair. So you look at this, and this, this determinants of a bar tells you the, the relative positions, and you count. And then the, the easy consequence is that if the signature is AB, where A is the smaller one, if A is not B, it could be at most to A. And if it is B, it could be at most to A minus one, which means that in this case, I can have up to three. And in this case, that cannot be more than two. Even for any N in any dimension, if my points are the, the, the vertices are finely independent and I pick the last point inside the convex hole, in any dimension, I cannot have more than two positive real roots. Okay, so what about the optimality of the bound? Um, so, in fact, we prove not that any A, the bound can, can be attained, but we prove that given an N and a signature, there is a way of choosing a configuration so that, so that the bound is attained. And it uses a very kind of complicated construction, which is called virus patchworking, which comes from tropical geometry. This is, again, it's kind of standard, but it's tricky. It's not, it's an ad hoc construction. So this is ad hoc. And then another corollary is that if the number is the maximum possible, which is n plus one, then all the maximal minors of C have to be, has, yeah, have to be non-zero. Because zero minors imply two P's in the same line. Okay. So if the number is, is maximum, then no, minor of C can be zero, and moreover, the signature has to be more or less half pluses and half minus. Unless your circuit has this condition and your metric has that condition, you cannot get N plus one uh, positive roots. And what about the parity? You remember that I told you <coughs> that the cut rule in one variable is very easy to see that the, the sign variation has the same parity that the number of positive roots. One here is more tricky, or trickier, I don't know how you say it in English. Uh, it, it is true that the parity of this count is the same, unless it could be not true if, if it happens that all the points in A lie in two parallel hyperplanes, then it might not be the case. Or uh, if uh, C is not uniform, if some minor is zero, it might also not be the case. So it's very tricky to even to decide the parity. Okay. And then, let me show you which are the missing pieces to, to generalize the theorem to many variables. So as I tried to explain to you, in one variable, the proof goes using Rolle theorem and this result that bounds the number of positive groups of F in terms of those of F prime. And in the first result that I told you, we, I, we didn't need to order the minors because we took all minors, but there was a Jacobian inside the proof. Okay, I didn't show you why, but there was a Jacobian. 
And in general, what happens is that in many variables, <coughs> there is no way of relating, even if I have, so I have this is uh, f equals zero and g equals zero, I have two beautiful curves, and they intersect in finitely many points, etc. There's no natural way of relating the zeros of the Jacobian, even if they are isolated, counting multiplicity, there is no known relation how to bound, how to decide on the number of uh, intersections knowing something about the Jacobian, vanishing of the Jacobian. There's no, there's no such result. For instance, the result which is in degree theory, it uses the Jacobian, but it's an alternating sum. So essentially, the only thing you can get is parity. You don't get the true number. Okay? There are some results that use this, but it's very tricky. So that we, we don't know how to relate vanishing of the Jacobian. Here, vanishing of the Jacob Jacobian means that the two uh, gradient vectors are parallel. Okay? And there are some partial results. One boy was, was, is by Hovansky, and then uh, Bihan and Sotili have another paper. And it says, OK, I have these two points of intersection, A and B. Then you look at one of the curves and the intersection of one of the curves with the Jacobian equal to zero, this will be such a point because here this, and between these two, there has to be a point where the Jacobian vanishes. But if you have n, you skip one and replace by the Jacobian. But then if you start iterating, you have two Jacobians there. Even in the plane, it's complicated because there is another, there's a not sharp bound, and there, are, there is another term which involves the number of unbounded components of this curve. And that, how do you count them? Or how do you use them? It's not possible to recurse on this. The best results are these. And also, we have no idea how to order the minors. Because as we had, the only condition that we have is that 0 is in the positive cone. So the vectors have to lie on a hyperplane. But if you are in dimension 3, how do you order vectors in a hyperplane? In the plane, it's, I go like this, just an angle, one angle. But if, even already in dimension 3, I have no idea how to order the minors. So because to, to, to have some sign variation, you need to order your, your numbers in some way. You have no idea how to order the minors. So, and really this is, I think these are difficult questions. Maybe the answer is, you know, the homology, or I don't know. Then maybe there's some not theory. I have no idea what's involved here, but certainly it's an idea that I don't have for the moment. So just as a summary, so I think that this case that I show you already shows that it's a complicated problem. And new ideas are needed even to conjecture which should be the formula. Not to prove it, but to conjecture. We don't have an idea how to write what could be conjecturally such a rule. And it's completely open. And just to end, I end with some polynomial beauties that were <laughs> Uh, drawn with using uh, Surfer, which is a fantastic software that you can download from that direction. Thank you.